So for our message time tonight, uh, we're going to talk about food, we're going to talk about taste, the experience of eating, and so we thought who better but then to pull in uh, the two top chefs of, of celebration, uh, Mark Heron, our kitchen coordinator, and uh, Aaron Dowzak, who uh, cooks a lot of food for us. Sometimes Aaron, when he smokes meat, actually sleeps in the building here, don't you, Aaron? Getting ready to it's bring... Just, it's easier to it, stay here. It's easier, yeah, to just stay right in the building. Um, so what we want to do is we're going we're gonna to have some conversation with Mark and Aaron about, about food and about the experience of genuine community around eating. We're also going to do a little bit of interactive time. And we've got our toss box right close, right? And so uh, uh, during, the, during the message time, if you want to share something with us, we want to have a little dialogue with you, we'd love to have you share a little piece too as we go along. But we're going to begin by just uh, talking to you guys who do a lot of our cooking and uh, say, say something to us about the joyful experience uh, of cooking and faithful service and what that means to you guys as you do your work around the church for people who are hungry. Uh, for me, it's really two things. It's, uh, it's an act of love and an act of service to be able to cook for the congregation. And it's uh, in, in, in many different ways. Um, anniversary parties, to worship on Wednesdays, to Advent and Lent meals, and unfortunately funerals as well. But I think I'm providing a level of comfort maybe for the family by providing them with a good meal on a day when they really need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's, a, it's an honor. It's an honor to serve you um, food. It's uh, out of our passion that we love to cook, that we love to share that with others. And I'm sure there's people out there that do the same thing for their families, that just out of the sheer joy of what it means to give of yourself out of your passions and uh, see the look on the faces of those that are enjoying. That's, mm -hmm. It's a true blessing. Mm -hmm. Would well, either of you have a story of just genuine community around eating that you remember that kind of sticks out in your mind? Who doesn't eat? <laughs> I'm, I'm good at it. Um, uh, just any time we gather around uh, with family, and I just think back to growing up, my mom has an entire, she has like eight sets of dishes that she brings off for different occasions. And it was one of these occasions where I had to polish the silver, which never gets used unless I'm there to polish it. <laughs> and the dishes that are put away until I come to get them out of the basement storage. And we gather around and she lights these little candles that have their own little holder on the plates. And each person has their own little snuffer. I know she sounds exaggerated, but she is. Each person she, had their own little snuffer. Your own little snuffer because you can't <laughs> blow it out because that just yeah. puts the wax everywhere. And my mom has these ideas of just dinner parties of just, that's her access service too, is just love and how do we serve and gather around a table and share. Um, one of the big things we do around meals is uh, we have to go around the table and during prayers we each have to pray. Hmm. Each have to share about our day, what's going on, what it's been going, what has been, and uh, just gather around that community and family is a good place to do that. How about you, Mark? Any experiences of genuine community around food that you recall? Uh, just this past Christmas. Um, every Christmas I do a big prime rib dinner for my family, one of my siblings and their spouses, and my mom and dad. But uh, this year, my dad was not well enough to travel from White Park to Sartell. That's, that's a different story. But So I had extra space on the table. And my mom actually indicated she wasn't going to come anyways because she, my dad wasn't coming. So then I had two places. And uh, Rosemary and Paul weren't able to go to New Jersey this year because they had spent all their money on replacement windows on their home. <laughs> and so I invited them to Christmas dinner. And uh, it was really nice. It was really enjoyable, and I really got to know them, like personally. I know them, you know, just from working with them. But it was, it was a really nice opportunity to get to know somebody sure. on a deeper level. Sure. I don't know if you can imagine what it's like on Christmas Eve if you if you're part of the pastor's family. But when my when, when our twins were three years old and our son was an infant, um, it was between services on Christmas Eve when we were living in Marshall. And I called Lisa and said, "What should we have for dinner?" And she said, "Bring Chinese." <laughs> Because, of course, who wants to cook on Christmas Eve with tiny children? And so we've actually made Chinese food between services at Christmas Eve every year. Uh, that's a tradition in our home. Toss me the talks, toss box. We want to hear if other people have experiences of tradition uh, 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 in their family around eating or sharing a meal. And Kim's going to tell us a good fun story. Kim, tell us one fun one, and then we'll see if we can get the ball rolling. You can stand up so everyone can see and while they, while they hear your fun story that you shared with My me. My fun story, huh? Okay, this was about five years ago. Um, 
I had invited, I love to host Thanksgiving, haven't for many years just because of health reasons of elderly people in my family, but prior to that, I was hosting about 20 people at my house. It was worked all day Wednesday, it was Wednesday evening, Tuesday night I had made some pies, or maybe after school I had made some pies. Um, I was making our family's traditional cornbread stuffing um, that requires stir frying celery and butter and things and I had this batter made for the, cel or for the stuffing or the cornbread. Um, I was stir frying that, that, the stir frying, the celery I finished, I set that aside, turned around to get my cornbread, which is in a Pyrex pan, a 9 by 13 Pyrex pan. Noticed the oven wasn't up to temp, so I set it down and started cleaning up all of the bowls and other things. My pies were sitting there, I was getting excited, it was like 8 o'clock, I was getting close to being done, ready to go to bed. Suddenly I had an explosion of a Pyrex pan that, because I had set it on a hot burner by accident, I had shards about eraser size of the entire pan all over my kitchen. The cornbread was hanging from the cabinet to the <laughs> ceiling. I had to dump out the pies. I had to dump out the celery stir fry stuff. I had to dump out everything. Mom brought some pies <laughs> and yeah. We started over and it was eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a food tradition in their family? A recipe that they hand down or something that they do? Yeah, Nate's got a good story too. We talked about this. Tell us your story, Nate. Hi, I'm Nate. If you don't know me, uh, we moved up here a couple years ago and we had kind of one of these eureka moments. And uh, he's right, we talked about this before and said I would share this. Uh, but this story all starts with Granny, which is from back home in western Wisconsin. Granny is my dead great grandmother, Nora Sowell. And she. I could tell the granny stories for about two hours because she was this spitfire of a woman, was super kind, but everything you'd imagine from an old farm life. And uh, would send me letters to when I was in elementary school from Touchdown Avenue about my favorite football team. And I never talked to her. She didn't know anything about football. And she cooked, she's classic. There's no recipe book. She sits in the kitchen, she grabs, she dumps. And, then, and it turns out great every time. And so, but as you know, granny passed away. And shortly before that, uh, we had started trying to collect those recipes. You know, good luck. You'd sit there with her and you'd measure it out and then you'd try it, oh, not quite right. So you'd try again, remeasuring. One of the best recipes was her mol uh, molasses cookies. And they're to die for. Like the last time I was like, like the only time I was ever in a physical altercation almost was somebody took those cookies from me in college when I was away from my dorm room for a little bit. <laughs> because they're individual wrapped molasses cookies with a glazed frosting on them and they're just amazing to die for and so where am i going with this where's the community we talked about you know transgenerational stuff so fast forward now we've moved up here living up here for not quite two years and it's last christmas and we're trying to make those cookies and throughout you know decade over a decade of people trying to recreate the cookie in my family so my grandmother who's also an exceptional cook the uh and baker nobody can ever get the frosting right so we decide we're going to try to redo it, and my wife and daughter, so Linnea and Jess here, and they go to they go to work, and by golly, the recipe we have is halfway there. Like there's missing ingredients, it's not going to work. So what do we do? You call grandma, call up grandma, so, and she gives us, oh yeah, do this, dump that, dump that, blah blah blah. Okay, we got the cookie, and my wife nailed it. <laughs> and Yay, barely ever met Granny. I think saw her maybe three times, two times, and then her funeral. And she gets the cookie. And she's in the kitchen cooking with Linnea, passing it on. And so we tried to do the glazed frosting. It's just not right. And that was usually the kicker. Grandma could get the cookie, but nobody ever got the frosting. And not frosting, it's a glaze, excuse me. The, uh, she makes it, and what is it, what is it? So we call Grandma again. Grandma's like, I'm going to take another look. I'm going to go through the old cookbooks. She goes through, she finds a post-it note or a piece of cardboard she's stuck behind a page. We found the missing ingredient. It's rum. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, keep going though. I'm sitting there and we're up at the new house and I gotta be honest, I miss home. And I'm sitting there and looking, there's my wife and daughter who's recreated the magic granny cookie. I get misty, I just talking about her. Uh, makes the cookie and I look at Jess and I'm like, you did it. I mean, you, she never compares to my grandmother or my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and that day, she nailed it. And, and Jess is like, I did it? I've done something amazing. I've recreated the cookie. And then Linnea, she has the same spunk as Granny, just goes, 
easy for you to say, you don't have molasses all over your cookie, all over your hands. <laughs> so the, the point as we talked to the pastor was like community and around the food, there it is, generations passing. And that was like one of those nights where I felt distinctly reassured about our decision to move up here. Mm. And so there it is. That's nice. I, yeah, go ahead, put your hands together. That's nice for Tim and for Nate. I thought maybe alcohol is the answer to everything was where you're gonna go with that, I don't know. Yeah, in Wisconsin. Wow, you said it, I didn't. Um, does anyone else have a food tradition or a cooking tradition or a recipe or anything that they'd like to share that they think is fun? Megan, here, I'm gonna toss you the toss box. Toss? Yeah, so, the toss um, box. Uh, the Bound family secret, myself and my husband Andy here, is that um, our entire relationship has been built around food. We actually met in culinary school, um, and neither of us work in the industry anymore, but um, have evolved our relationship and our family connectedness around food. Uh, my wedding um, bridal shower was all foods from different sides of our families, and my very favorite wedding presents were um, scrapbooks that were made from each family member that has different recipes um, from my mom's cousins' cousins to Andy's aunts and uncles. Um, it's a scrapbook of like three different um, ones from both sides of the family. Uh, unbeknownst to my side of the family, his mother had already started this album when my cousin had asked her to do so. So it was kind of a really cool connection. Um, when Andy's grandmother passed away, now I'm gonna cry. <laughs> mm. Granny never liked cakes and dinners and all of that stuff. That wasn't Granny's thing. She wanted to have cookies, cookies and coffee. And um, we wanted to do an assortment of different cookies. And Andy and I have never been afraid to tackle recipes and nobody had made rosettes. And when my grandmother had passed away, I had asked for the rosette iron. And uh, we decided that we would take on rosettes. We'd never taken out the rosette iron from my grandmother's passing. And uh, his mom was kind of telling us what the recipe was. She remembers making it, and uh, I couldn't remember. We're both kind of standing there at 10 o'clock on a Thursday night, the night before the funeral, <laughs> trying to figure it all out. Uh, couldn't remember. We're Googling recipes, and we open up the box, and there in my grandmother's handwriting is the recipe and the instructions in a complete replica of everything his mother had told him that Granny was, and we just both kind of stood there and cried and thanked both of our grandmothers. Um, so we do family traditions of making my grandfather's potato sausage every year after hunting season, and our, our love and relationships have totally been around food. That's sweet, thank you. You can put your hands together for Megan too, so thank you. So, so you can see how powerful the experience of food is, of cooking, uh, the hilarity of it sometimes, but also just the way that we get a, get a little weepy just talking about the people who pass those recipes on to us and the, the experiences of eating those recipes with them. Uh, let's ask a dis different question and, and get a little closer to wrapping up. And the question I want to ask you and see if we can get some interactive around is, is do we still eat with that same, that same reverence and prayer and reflection as maybe people once did? Uh, I think now with our, our, our uh, experiences around food and, our, and the way we move through our lives and, and we eat so fast, uh, are, are we missing some of that reverence and some of that prayerful reflection uh, around food? And does your family have an experience that you use to kind of help you slow down and focus on the important things of food? Yeah, here. Katrina, thanks. So I will answer the question, but first I just want to thank the people sitting up front because I think we've, in our family, built a ton of community around eating here at church. We've met so many people, our kids have met so many people, so I just really wanna thank you for that. Yeah, thanks guys, we love you. Thanks. So to answer the question, um, I bought a sign from Hobby Lobby that says, and it's hanging in the kitchen, and it says, nobody eats until we say amen. And that has really worked. And so sometimes Joe and I will be busy sitting at the dinner table and just want to get dinner started. And one of the kids will say, oh, oh, read the sign. No one eats till we say amen. So then everybody pauses and, and we pray or one of the kids will pray. So that's something we've done in our home. Thank you. Anyone else have a tradition or, or an, an experience around, around meals that they find helpful? Anything? You know, Eric Schlosser in his, in his book, Fast Food Nation, says that when you change the way 
people eat, you change the culture. And I think that that's true when you look at, at the experience that we have around food today. Uh, just wondering, do we stop and, and think about where our food has come from? Do we stop at any time during that meal time to, or beforehand to, to think about God's providing of that meal and the experience that really is reverent around, around eating and food? Guys, any other thoughts up front here as we're kind of wrapping closer to the end? Yeah, we're good. Oh, yeah, there you go. Give, give you the toss box. Uh, just go back to that last one. Yeah. Um, kids are great. As a youth director, and things do get busy, and lives get crazy, and schedules, and all that, um, sometimes it's not even on the forefront of my mind as to what are we doing next, where we're we going. Uh, but my son, the six year old, he'll uh, say, Hang on, we need to stop. We need to give thanks. So his role then is always to start the prayer. Mm -hmm. And we got to go around the table. Mm -hmm. And it's not done until we're holding hands and squeezing the next person, mm -hmm. that connection. Mm -hmm. I think that's the whole point of what we're really getting at is that there's connection around yeah. food and around yeah. that love. Yep. I, heard, I read a great, a great uh, little piece of many years ago by a pastor in a, um, in a church newsletter. And it said, every time you pray before a meal, you evangelize yourself. Think about it. You know, every time you pray before a meal, you evangelize yourself. The experience of deepening that that sen that sense of uh, of taste and and really re recognizing where your food has come from and God's uh, gracious providing. So let's just turn a corner and get right to the end of what we really want to say. Then at the end of some of this great talk, um, how how central is food? Uh, think about it this way: the only miracle in all that's found in all four Gospels that Jesus did is the feeding of the five thousand. That should say something about how central food is. And that taste experience really does, um, uh, really does something for our memory and, and, and for our faith. Uh, remember the story of the Passover, that uh, w when that experience was done, that the people were to always go back and to reflect on that by what? By eating unleavened bread and remembering the hurried departure from Egypt, or by eating the bitter herbs with the Passover meal so they would remember the bitterness of, of bondage. And think for a moment, we talked about this, Aaron, how much of our ministry is focused around food. Uh, food for Pleasant View, 30-hour famine, uh, uh, Place of Hope, Kosovo, uh, meal trains, how much of what we do revolves around that. That just goes to show you how central food is and how the experience of taste really does jog the memory and deepen the faith. And God wants to go beyond words when we come to the Lord's table, of course, with the bread and with the wine, and it's good for us to remember that in the ancient world, bread was the staff of life, wine was the experience of celebration, and when God invites us to that table, and Christ says, I, I am in the bread, I am in with and under the wine, it's that 